the intention might be there, but when a practice gets busy, no matter how good the intention is, things like follow-up just get put to the side. Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast with Dr. Jesse Green, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Listen in each week as we bring you an inspiring person who will share their story, ideas, and business techniques to help you create a practice and a life you love. And now introducing your host, Dr. Jesse Green. Welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast, the show where great dentistry meets great business. Some of you guys will know from my background that I have a huge interest in internet marketing. In fact, for a long time, I ran a digital marketing agency for dentists where we did a whole lot of stuff around websites, a whole lot of stuff around marketing, directing traffic, and so on. When I was doing that, I came across a lot around automation, which you know general business uses really, really effectively, really, really well. But for the longest time, that has not been really part of the dental landscape. And in today's podcast episode, we're going to be talking about some changes that are happening. And my guest today is Nathan Paris, who is the founder and CEO of Dental Conversions. Nathan is an absolute IT whiz and he's a marketing guy as well. So he's able to combine these two skill sets with great effect and is bringing some of this automation into the dental marketplace, which I think is long overdue and is a really, really wonderful thing for dentists and their practices to be able to better help patients, have better follow-up, and ultimately improve the performance of the practice so it's consistent and effective every single time. In this particular interview, Nathan talks a lot about how to structure treatment follow-up, how to structure reactivation, and the role that automation might play as part of that. He goes through the importance of having these sequences mapped out, but retaining a human element to it because you know, after all, we are treating patients, and Nathan's really big on that. It's a really wide-ranging interview. We cover lots of territory. We talk about you know different software platforms as well. And as always, there'll be lots of things you'll want to take notes about. Nathan drops tons and tons of useful information, you know, nuggets of gold that I know are going to be really practical in your practice on Monday. So I hope you take the time to jot down your notes and take them to work on Monday and put them into place. So without any further ado... Here's Nathan Paris from Dental Conversions. Nathan Paris, welcome to the Savvy Dentist Podcast. Thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come spend some time with us. Mate, you run a group called Dental Conversions, which is doing some really good things in the dental space at the moment. But I know you you and I had an opportunity to catch up recently in Canberra, and I got to hear a bit about your backstory and understanding who you are and where you've come from. But For those people who may not know that story, I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about your journey into this space. Have you always been interested in in dental marketing or has it been a bit of a process? How did you come to this point in your life? Hey, Jesse. uh, First, thank you for taking the time on your side too. I I love your podcast, so thank you for having me on. Ah, Thanks, mate. You're welcome. Yeah, I think my journey, you know, I've always been in the world of systemizing and automating. So, you know, I started back, you know, over 20 years ago, just more from an IT perspective on how to systemize businesses and corporations. And that led me to about probably five years ago is more, more, you know, um, relevant for what we're doing now. But five years ago, then I started wanting to, to help small businesses and started seeing, okay, where, where can we help them? Where, where can we help co- cut operations costs? Where can we help um, increase, you know, sales and closing and we started really being specific on marketing automation for small businesses. And that led, uh, that was started here in Australia when we moved here. You know, I've been living here about seven years now in Australia. And that led to then learning about the dental industry. We started working with a few dentists and little by little, we started realizing, hold on, there's even, there's even more of a gap we saw in, in the dental, I think with practices and, you know, how can we help systemize, automate, and then that started leading really into, you know, how can we help actually increase conversion rates and acceptance rates and and save staff, you know, a ton of time. So it, it started from just IT systemizing corporations to small businesses to learning about the dental industry to that's where we're at now. Yeah. Okay. So it's been a bit of an evolution by the sound of it. Yeah, definitely. I think I've, the lessons just from. I mean, lessons from years ago just keeps getting applied to, you know, it's just building and building and just learning more specific and more specific. So, yeah, it's been a great journey. I mean, and now I just, yeah, I love 
I just love it. So I, I get too geeky sometimes probably, but I, I really enjoy sitting there and studying and seeing what's working, what isn't, how can we help more and just get into it. And now that we're really, you know, so focused on dental, you just get to learn it more. I think that's one thing I'm really appreciating is, you know, before we were working with a lot of different types of businesses. Now, you know, my whole focus is really the dental and you just, uh, even client base, you just get a, I don't know, you can have beers with people. <laughs> like it's it's simple things like that. It's much easier to have conversations and relationships with clients when you start really getting specific on industry. And I enjoy craft beer, so I try to find clients that also enjoy beer, which is easier in Australia than yeah, it. Well, <laughs> you'll have no shortage of clients who enjoy beer here, mate. I can I can guarantee it for sure. And I think I probably fit that bill, which we didn't get to have a beer the other day, but then we'll come back I know. to that. I know. It's all right. Anyway, all right. that's good. But you did say to me, so just before we get into it, because I do want to come back to you, a little bit because it is curious because I have actually been you know I think we've been co-stalking one another around the internet for a little while because I certainly came across on the fuse you know originally you know that that business which I know is part of what you do but I certainly came across your material a little while ago and and I certainly had been reading some of your stuff and I know we'd kind of exchanged a few ideas on LinkedIn and whatnot and what I really love about what you're doing is the whole automation piece because one of the things that I find when, you know, we talk about, you know, treatment follow-up and we talk about reactivating patients and all the rest of it is the whole automation piece because people, no matter how well-intentioned they are, they tend to forget stuff. And I know you've got this really nifty process, which I'm going to plumb the depths of in a minute. But I guess from your perspective, when it comes to systemizing, when it comes to automating, when it comes to, you know, getting some good processes in there – what do you see as the biggest challenges, you know, that dentists might face? Where do you see people kind of going wrong? I think one is, especially is busy. I, I think the human element, and I think you, you hit it spot on, is the intention might be there. But when a practice gets busy, no matter how good the intention is, things like follow-up get, just get put to the side. And I, I think that's that's really number one. I think I talk to so many practice managers because – you know, obviously the journey starts with the principal, but really when we start getting into it, you know, I'm talking to the practice managers and the coordinators. And I, I don't even think sometimes, I think there's a big disconnect even from the principal to, to the coordinators on how much stress these guys are under sometimes. I don't think they realize how much there is to do to follow up and track it and make sure they have tracked it and make sure, okay, this is the second time I, I've called or a second email I've done and what's the next thing I'm supposed to do. And when you throw that into the world of, all the other stuff they're supposed to be doing from clinical to, you know, to, you know, this is really run the business part. I just think there's, there, there's just a ton to do. And that busyness sh- throws aside. The second part of it is the human side is they actually hate it. <laughs> I think, I think this is another one that isn't shared enough with the principals, but when you start talking to them, man, they hate it. They, they feel like after a while, they're really just doing cold calls. I've seen it where, you know, they'll be running, you know, their lists about once a month or every two weeks even. And they're going through that list almost as fast as possible, hoping to leave a message. Yeah. Right. right? I mean, because it's it's just after after a few, they start feeling like they're getting rejected and they forget. No, no, no. This is a good thing. This treatment, they need this. You know what I mean? They forget that. And after a while, it's just they're going through it. So I think that busy and honestly, they just they hate it. And then it just it goes from there from the consistency to what if you have staff changes to all these things, um, sick, people are sick. Then you, anyway, after a couple of months, things pile up and now just made everything we talked about even worse. Yeah. And look, there's a couple of really useful things I think, you know, you've touched on there and I'd like to kind of pick up some of those things you put down because one of the things that I, I find as well, because, you know, you and I sing from the ha- same hymn sheet a lot with this material. And the thing that I observe around this as well is sometimes people kind of forget the whole helpfulness part is we're actually trying to help patients. We're not trying to bug them. We're not trying to harass them. We're not trying to actually stalk them or or be you know, annoying in any way at all. We're actually really trying to provide a service to these patients that they actually need. And so I think you're right. I've observed in lots of different practices and certainly in the past in my own as well, where I'd ask someone to you know follow up on you know, some treatment or whatever it is, and they'd try and race through it as quickly as they can, 
tick the job off and think I've done the task, but they're not focusing on the outcome of that task. So they kind of like get the job done. They didn't answer, tick it off. I'm never calling them again because I feel awkward. (laughs) And and, and the appointment book still hasn't been taken care of, but I've ticked that task off, right? So I guess what you're saying is that if we can approach it differently, A, we can overcome some of the human errors. We can overcome that feeling of awkwardness or ickiness, but at the same time continue to provide great care. Yeah, I agree. Exactly. And I think we don't realize and, and even even not even just staff, the principles that you know, I see, because I know you go into it, but, you know, case acceptance is, you know, we, everyone forgets that, you know, everyone forgets that we're actually trying to help help these patients. And even from point of view of it becomes difficult to even mention the price sometimes when you're presenting. I mean, we all see this and it all comes down to the most basic form of fear of rejection. And so. That, that goes on to the staff and, and it goes up and down levels. And we forget, though, that actually we are here to help and what we're doing is helping. And when you start looking at responses, because obviously we, we, you know, we're tracking stuff and watch, we're monitoring conversations back and forth. And after follow up for three months, which most practices are like, ooh, that's it. But we, we see stuff like, thank you so much for still keeping in touch. I've just been so busy. And we will forget that people are busy, especially in this day and age. And actually, they are thankful that you are the one practice, especially if they're starting to talk to a couple, like if there's a, you know, hey, I want to, I want to, you know, see other opinions. You're the one practice that actually took the time, made sure that you kept in touch with them. And there, there's a thankfulness, not a bothering, a thankfulness. I completely agree, and I'm just about to admit to parenting fail number three million and fifty two <laughs> on this podcast. <laughs> So you can imagine what the other ones preceding it have been. Uh, But interestingly enough, the local optometrist that we go and see here, yeah, my daughter has worn glasses in the past. She doesn't so much now, but she just needs to get her eyes tested periodically. And so we've had that reminder sitting on our fridge with a magnet for goodness knows at least 12 months, right? And so this is the parenting fail part. And you know, we have every intention of doing it. And when we try and ring the practice, you know, the receptionists there are not especially friendly. But all it would really take, it would be so good if someone would ring me and say, hey, Jesse, you know, we really need to book your daughter in and get these eyes checked out. Have you got your calendar in front of you? It'd be great. Oh, so I love the follow-up piece, mate. That's great. We actually, uh, let you bring up parenting. So this might sound sick, but we, we did an experiment with uh, actually two children. <laughs> God, where, where is this going? Well, we both, they both need orthodontics. So I'm like, I want to see what's really happening in the world. So we sent them to five different ones and I wanted to see who's following up. And basically none of them followed up, just so you know. And we're talking, I want the major ones. I don't want to say names, but we want the major and uh, close and all that. And one of them did send a letter eventually. And I think it was like 45 days afterwards. Cause I'm actually, you know, counting the days again, sick, but it's true. And we already decided by that. And I'm like, man, I need to get my kid in there. Now, if I wouldn't have decided, maybe that would have been the one that would got me. But the one that got me did actually follow up a bit sooner. And we did five. And there was really only one that didn't even follow up. And even that one was too late, in my opinion. But that's all right. That's because I am a little anal. But, you know, the other ones, I think, yeah, three, there was zero. And then one, actually, we got a letter about, like I said, about 45 days. But it was done by them. You know, and it's the same thing. If I would just had someone that took the time to say, hey, your, your daughter is important. So I am making sure to call you that it's a done deal i was signed up right away like thank you and and that is because my wife's busy and it was my wife getting contact not me she's busy she's probably busier because she's the one that is running around half the time and so same thing you call her she's gonna be thankful so yep you're you're it and it's really funny nathan because the thing about those practices that didn't follow up properly is they will never know they'll never know how much business they've actually really lost all they'll they'll probably go oh yeah whatever that person's not coming in for whatever reason, and they may not even inquire beyond that. But for them, how much business are they losing by not following up? Yeah, and I think that's every business out there. It's not just dental. You know, I think that's the thing is, you know, when we saw this, we started with other businesses. It's not just dental, but I think we just see even more in dental because, you know, I think the fact is dental has been used to people just coming. Yeah. And and so, and this is where, you know, I'll ask you your input. I haven't run a practice, so this is when I'm asking these questions. But the feedback I'm getting is, you know, they dentists are, and uh, anyone in dental, they're used to patients just coming, but that's changing now, you know. And I think that this is normal business. And normal business, when you do quote a quote, 
we'll just call it a quilt, right? And in, in, in our world, it's a treatment plan or it's, you know, the, the recall kind of, we do a quilt and in, in normal businesses, you, if you don't follow up, you, you were going under. Yeah, yeah. Quickly. Okay. And I mean, quickly. Right. And so in the dental world, it hasn't been like that. Um, there hasn't been as much competition, things like, but you start seeing the shifts are happening. People are like, okay, something needs to change. And exactly what you said. Right now, practices don't even know how much they're losing or why they lost it because they're not following up to find out. So you'll never know. Yeah, look, you're absolutely right, Nathan, because in times gone by, you know, the whole supply and demand equation was tipped in favor of, you know, practices, you know, having more patients than they could possibly ever hope to deal with. But as competition increases, what I'm seeing and certainly what I'm encouraging the guys I work with is to become better business owners because... In times gone by, you just didn't need to be as diligent with your business practices because of that supply-demand thing. But now, that that situation has changed. And the thing is, I don't think necessarily that the mindset across the profession, I'm, there are definitely some people who are on board and really doing good things, but I think it's taking a little while for the profession to catch up with the fact that they need to be doing better business, not just better dentistry. And there needs to be that mix of both, good dentistry and good business. And, you know, obviously, you're really familiar with that. Hey, mate, I just wanted to touch quickly on something because my observation with incomplete treatment, and I know we've had some conversations about this, and and for full disclosure to the audience, Nathan and I do some work together in our practice. Nathan's helping us with a few things there, which is great. But one of my things I've observed with practices in the past is when it comes to reactivating patients or following up incomplete treatment even or whatever form of communication – Many practices adopt what I call the post and pray method, which is, you know, you send the letter, you put it in the mailbox, and then, you know, you cross your fingers and hope for the best. But my view is there needs to be a much more structured process. There needs to be multiple points of communication. What do you think about that? Would you agree with that? Would you disagree with that? Or how much communication is too much? You know, what's your thoughts? Yeah, a a thousand percent. I agree. I think... Again, those days are over just the one form of, of communication and one type of communication. So I think you need different types of communication. And I think it needs to be systemized and consistent. I think consistent is number one. And two is it needs to be systemized so that you know where in the process you are with this patient of doing follow up. From what we see stat wise, we, and so we, we tried with a lot of practices, worked with a lot of practices. You know, most practices, it, it, and, and this is, you know, there's there's a lot of successful practices out there too. So even the successful ones, you know, we we'll chat to, and they will have a process for this. So it's not like they don't have any process. They'll have a process. Usually it consists of running a report um, every one to two weeks. A coordinator, a practice manager goes through the report. And and this is norm. They do two, they'll do two calls and then they'll kind of just leave it because after two calls, it get, becomes too difficult, right? They're not sure what they did. They're starting to put notes in their systems, D4W or something like that. And then there's, and then it just becomes too hard because by the end of the year, you got, I don't know, 400, 500 patients that you still should be following up with, but how, right? It just becomes too difficult. Then they'll, some of their, I mean, there's some seriously awesome coordinators out there, by the way, that, the spreadsheets they've shown me that they do the, do this is ridiculous. I even, I've even said, God, give me that. That's amazing. And then they're using this crazy spreadsheet, which fills in dates. And, oh, my God, we need a, the fourth contact. I'm We've like, got macros in there. We've yeah, got oh, formulas. You name it. <laughs> it's, it's unbelievable. Like, you should be like computer programmer. Like, how do you do this? <laughs> like, I've done a lot of programming. I'm like, how do you do this? And exactly, they got these macros in there. Anyway, it's going it, uh, off topic. But the the consistency is, is absolutely number one and then we're I'll go back to they do the two calls but from the numbers we're seeing 80 percent of all calls left message go to voicemail okay so you can't even in my opinion count them almost as true uh, points of contact because they have not you have not reached that patient okay so the next thing we say is you need to be mixing those modes. So you need to be adding SMS, you need to be adding email, and you need to be doing the calls. And I think that's now where you're getting to going past the spray, right? I love that, the post, post and pray, where you just do a broadcast and good luck and may the gods do, of dentistry be with us. <laughs> and you just hope for it, right? But by putting a systemized approach saying, okay, 
we are going to, let's say reactivation. We're going to go, we're going to go through last, last year's patients. So maybe there's three to 500. First, we're going to start with an email, let's just say, or a text. Then a week later, we're going to give them a call. Then a week later, we're going to send them or do another one, whether it's email or text. And then a week later, we're going to send them a letter. So you just agreed on four, four types of communication over four weeks. And now you have a systemized approach because you've mixed modes. And you know, we start getting into what, why all of those. And you have to do them all if you want to actually get through them. So our, our big belief on incomplete treatments, so I'm jumping around, I apologize. Incomplete treatments, it really, it almost needs one to go because they just left your practice, right? The next 45 days are ridiculously imperative that you were following up. Because the next 45 days is when they're going through, am I going to shop around? They're going through, if this finances, you know, how, how do I do this? And they would love just to, you know, for, for you to reach out and make sure they know that you can help them. And they would just start forgetting after that point. And then there'll be like uh, parenting uh, error or w- w- what you mentioned. It, it, it would be on their mind, but they're, they're just going to kind of forget about it. Okay. So we believe that you need to be trying to do seven points of contact in that 30 to 45 days. And at first, everyone's like, wow, that's a lot. 50% of those seven points of contact, you never get to them. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so you maybe if you're doing two calls in there, maybe you got one of the calls. Emails, if they're written well, right? And we can try, maybe chat about that later. You're getting 35 to 40% open, right? If they're if written well. Text message are brilliant. Like they're going to see it. It's almost like 99. I forget what it is now, but it's 95 plus open rate. open rate, read rate, all that. But if you didn't hit them at the right time, they won't respond. And pe- people don't go back to text. I don't. But emails we go back to. Texts we don't. Phone calls we open. We answer if we can or we ignore it. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> you might, right? So it's it's a mixing these. Is that why I can't get onto you? No, sh- no, 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 Jesse. No, 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 no. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Uh, let, let, wait, let me make sure. No, no, no. no so it, it's that mixing. It's a consistency. It's having a process saying this is what we're doing. That's the biggest key, putting that all together. Yeah, so I really love the fact that you're taking such a systematic approach to that, Nathan, because, again, you know, we're seeing from the same hymn sheet in the sense that what you're doing is you're taking a process but you're adding automation to it so you're adding the fact that you know you've got these modes of communication you've got your sms you've got your email you've got your telephone but you're also making sure that it happens on time every time and that the process just flows as opposed to the poor old treatment coordinator practice manager receptionist whoever it may be having to do all these tasks, getting taken off task every time the phone rings or a patient come, walks through the door or whatever it is, trying to come back to it. So, you know, what I'm hearing you say, if, if I got it correctly, is that if we can automate these tasks, A, you're freeing up the time of your, your staff, B, you're ensuring that this process happens seamlessly and consistency, and C, you're going to get much better outcomes because you've got these different forms of communication that are being delivered, you know, seamlessly is that basically it? Yeah, definitely. Because everything I'm saying, and I encourage anyone on here, you know, if you want to automate, just just put this into the practice and say we're going to do this. And you can still do it manually, right? But we all know, like I said, once you start getting past a few hundred patients, you know, and they're 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 they go into 45 days and things like, it, as a human, it's it just becomes almost impossible to, to do what I'm doing. But you can still improve on the first 30 days and say, this is what we're doing. And you could use a human to do it. But it, it's like you said, they get pulled off task, they get busy, and all of a sudden, two days go by or a week goes by, sick happens, and you're just backed up. And all now the systemized approach that we said, okay, on week two, we send this. Yeah, the whole timing goes out. Gone. Gone. And this is the biggest one you see is that, okay, even the practice, okay, week one, we do give them a call. Week three, we give them their call. But I'll talk to them and say, well, yeah, but we got too busy for two months of the year. And it's like a two-month cycle. Two months goes by, they, oh, we got to do it again. They'll be good for two months and then two months go by and, and it just it just happens. Yeah. And just another point that you touched on what I'd like to come back to, there's two points actually I'd like to come back to because there's some really 
useful nuggets of gold in there that I think are worth exploring a little bit further. You mentioned earlier that the first 45 days is critical, but that first 30 days is super critical. My observation when people are trying to either reactivate patients or you know have treatment followed up, whatever, is typically they start with the oldest patients first, the people who are most out of date first. Oh, yeah. And I, I think that's just such a big mistake because, you know, you, you get the people while they're still warm, the people who have been gone for, you know, 150, 180 days or, th- you know, 365 days or whatever, I mean, they're quite cold as far as leads and prospects go. Do you see any of that happening as well? Oh, yeah, definitely. I think your first 30, 45 days are getting your highest conversions. When you go past three months, they drop. And then you go three to six months, there's a difference. Six to 12 months, there's quite a big difference. And then past 12 months, 12 to 24 months, it's just, yeah, it's really hard. And if it's not automated, it's almost, I don't know if I would do it. That is where you, you, you get that. That is where I'm, I'm not sure if the bank for but because that's when you're going to get a lot of responses. Hey, I've moved. I end up going to someone else, you know, just whatever it is, you, you'll get a lot of the responses. So clean up your database. But, you know, to do that w- without automation past the 12 months, I don't know if I do. But but two twenty two twelve months, you know, from now to twelve months for sure. But I, I exactly what you said I've seen and it's complete opposite from the data we know. So start with whoever you saw most recently and work the other way. Yeah. For sure. Because I am I'm OCD enough that I have actually we've actually run our entire database going back a couple of years and so we have done that process and I can tell you the number of man hours that it took was phenomenal. And obviously this is before I'd met you. Otherwise, we would have automated it, but it is it is huge. But the other thing I just wanted to pick up a thread that you mentioned earlier was that seven contacts. You know, you're talking about the seven contacts and half of them aren't actually listened to or received. Interesting, that ties in really neatly with it in another study, which is Google's Zero Moment of Truth study, which talks about you know, creating as many touch points as possible before people make a significant buying decision. And people according to this study, will you know, take you know, on average of you know, up to seven hours and up to 11 contacts, you know, touch points with, an, with a business before they'll make a buying decision, a significant buying decision. And so what I really love about this system that you're talking about is you know, we're trying hard to keep that relationship being nurtured. We're trying hard to you know, be front of mind, trying hard to continue to add value even all the way up to that buying decision and beyond, which you know, hopefully will then you know, improve your conversions as well. Yeah, I think I, I love that. I, I, I think I, I think you mentioned that in another podcast, and I actually went and uh, read that afterwards, and it was so spot on with everything we've seen. I know they're saying eleven points of contact now, and I think they're right. I think it's the stats we always go off of is seven, and what we really look at is after five to seven is where most of your conversions Magic are happens. happening. Yeah, yeah, it's just that is that's what. But I think it's getting pushed more too, and I think that's what the study is saying is. Because people are busier, people are doing more research, people are checking into things. I agree. I think it probably is getting pushed there. But to be honest, some of it we only we scare practices and when we say five to seven. Yeah. Like it is. There's a fear thing that practices have got to get over. It comes back to again, are we bothering touch? You are not bothering them. We are trying to give them the the, the best outcome for them. We are we just want to make sure we stay in contact. And like we said, the five to seven. 50 percent maybe got to them so it's it's i I love that say because it really it shows where it's even going more and you know you're from now if we chat again we'll be saying something different that's the thing is it it's changing so quickly yeah that in another year we're again we're annuals who are watching data so we'll be we'll be changing stuff like it's what we're doing now there's no way it's going to be that way in the year just it, it just happens too quick of course I wanted to just change tack for a little second because, you know, when you were in Canberra, I think it was last week, and we, we managed to catch up, which was great, we had quite a wide-ranging conversation of a few topics. I'd love to just kind of plumb a few of those threads for a second because, you know, you've obviously got your programming background, you're an IT you know, superstar, you can make IT do things that, you know, the rest of us could only dream of. And my background, you know, when I was running, you know, a digital agency for dentists, you know, I observed all these internet marketing trends around automation and and whatnot. And I used to sit there and I still sit there getting completely frustrated at the lack of integration of, you know, practice management software and some of their third party systems. And 
you know, so for all of those listening at SOE or D for W Centaur, please think about an open API. <laughs> that's my that's my on air plea, and I know we discussed this previously, but I'm curious to understand because you, you've got a obviously an American heritage, and you know, I'd like to draw upon that and say, okay, where do you see automation going for dentistry over the next little while? What do you have you seen in other countries? What do you observe in the the industry more generally? And how do you think that's going to relate to dentistry? I love this. I actually like looking at other industries and see where they're going well because I think it will then drip into dental. And I think one of the things we were chatting about is the practice management systems. This is, this is back to our plea for opening up APIs. I think if you look at the systems, there's a great one I like to always use now is, is zero. So zero accounting system. If you look what zero does, it does accounting really well, but anything else, it, it opens up an API and then wants other partners to do anything else. And if you just look at the trend in automation or software, you, you start, you're starting to see specialists come back in, in this arena. And like a practice management system, what, what, what I'm starting to see, what maybe this is me, my, me dreaming too, but I am starting, we started to see it a little bit more in the States. But um, you, you want a practice management system that does practice management and clinical ridiculously well. But you want it to, and at least in my opinion, I talked to other, other people, I, like stop trying to do marketing <laughs> to, my, to my patients. You know what I mean? Like that's, it, it's such a different specialty. I mean, this conversation we're having, all these things, this is just the, the, the top of like, when I look and study like who's opening and what and what we changed to open a dang email, like that's all we do, right? But I sure as heck am not going to get into wanting to know how to chart a molar. So, like I, I would be so confused. And But if you let me just go now talk about patient journey, man, I love that stuff. And that, that's that's how what we'll plug in. Like let us plug in to help on patient journey. So you see this in uh, apps like uh, Zero because – which is doing phenomenal, right? And that's what they're doing. They, they, they say, no, this is what we do. We're going to just stick to doing it real well. And let's, let's have plugins help us. Let's have partners help us. Let's open up the API. And there's talks about it on some of the big ones, but I'm with you. Like that plea isn't just for us, but it is for the dental industry. It will allow jumps, leaps and bounds moving forward exponentially faster than, than what we're seeing now where and not all of them, but you know, it's this general thing. But you still just see a lot of they they see this competition instead of instead of hey, we're opening up and we're going to allow um, the dental market and our clients and 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 open it up. Like you you'll, you'll create another industry almost within the industry by, by doing this, and everyone wins. Your client base. Why would they go anywhere else? Because you're allowing this other things to happen. And it's just I I don't know. Now I'm just you know. I'm just hoping. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, so I do see that's going to happen. I, I do think that it's almost going to be forced to happen if it doesn't happen. But I think the ones that jump on it earlier than later, it's just going to work out better for everyone. I, I, that's what I think is the real opportunity in practice management software is for someone to actually come along and create an open API. As you say, they really nail the practice management piece, but they open up the API for that third-party development. And then you've got this whole secondary marketplace for you know, add-ons and you know, Zero's growth is not powered just by Zero. It's this whole marketplace of third-party providers saying, "Hey, we've built a Zero plugin or a Zero, you know, whatever it happens to be uh, widget." And all of a sudden, you've got these external providers now promoting Zero on their behalf. And Zero's growth has been nothing short of spectacular. And so I think, yeah, that's why you know, Myob and all those other kind of companies are going, "Holy moly, what just happened?" But yeah, to me, the dental practice management companies that we currently see are kind of like the myob, and they're very vulnerable to someone coming along with a smarter business plan. But equally, you know, if they're smart and they get on board, I think there's a massive opportunity for them too. But so, well, I guess where I'm going with that question, Nathan. Sorry, to, I, I've kind of got on my soapbox a little bit there. <laughs> <That's> okay. <laughs> anyway, I'll hop back down. But what I wanted just to ask you about is, you, you know. In terms of automations, if there was an open API yeah, and we could do this, so my great wish would be to be able to track a patient from you know lead, not even a patient, before they're a patient, to be a patient, to having all these beautiful follow-up sequences. Do you see that as something that's going to be a natural evolution? Do you think it's possible? Is it doable? Am I, am I, uh, am I dreaming? <laughs> do I, do I... No, it, it will be there. No, it is guaranteed. 
there's no way. I mean, we're just what we're doing right now. We're doing treatment follow up, right? You will then, we, and we have recall. We're going to be doing a recall follow up, but that is such the tip of it. We are talking full patient journey from the second they become a lead to how do we nurture them to get them to book that consult to after the consult follow up. So now we got we present them with the treatment plan, follow them up. They came to the appointment. What, how are we going to follow up with them after that appointment? Here's what to expect. You just had a crown. Here's what to expect over the next week. Here's checking in on you yeah, and automated so that, again, people aren't trying to have to remember, put a note in there, you know, make a call. No, no. Automated throughout. To would you mind giving us some feedback? Here's a survey. If you didn't move forward, hey, would you mind telling us why not to move forward? Like this is it. it there's no maybe. Like this will be happening. <laughs> like it's, 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 if you look at, again, I'm just looking at trend of business and I'm seeing this flow from business into dental, right? And it's just, there's, it will be happening. How long will it take to happen? That'll be, you know, it's another conversation, but it's not far off. I mean, you know, what we're starting to do, we can, you know, we're even looking, plugging all these things. So it's just not if, it's when. And everyone will be doing it. It, it. it just will be. Yeah. Mate, I've been waiting seven years for this, so it can't come soon <laughs> enough. So, you know, I think that's great. And, and just to be clear, just because, you know, Nathan and I are using some language here, I just want to be sure that anyone listening kind of gets this. When we say automating, it's not about just taking the human element out. It's, you know, there'll be parts that are delivered electronically, but part of it is to then send a message to your practice manager or receptionist, whoever's saying, don't forget to call Mrs. Smith. So you still have that systemization, but you have humanization in that as well. But there's a reminder, a prompt, so that we're not relying on anyone's memory or, or, or whatnot to get the job done. So I think just to be clear about that point as well. Yeah, no, it's, it, it, that's really good because that goes, the personal part, the human part has to still be there. And it even goes to, I just want to bring this up because you bring up um, human part. Even what you're sending content-wise needs to be done in a way so it's very human, right? And I think we're probably talking more treatment follow-up, but it, jargon needs to go out the door. And it just needs to be a chat. That's the best way to put it. It's just a chat. So even even your content, it isn't like a sales page and banner. It's just a chat. You're having a chat with your, your patient. So just want to point that out too, because I agree. It's, it, it, you're never removing the human element. We're just helping those humans so that a bunch of it's being done for them on the side, but then they're still being notified so that they, they, it's not going to slip through to, hey, time to give Bob a call. Yeah, yeah, cool. Mate, and I just, you've picked up a thread that we put down earlier, and I just want to make sure we run with it a little bit. You said earlier that email open rates are up around about 30% provided that they're well written. And that's a fairly big proviso because, you know, emails uh, can be you know, exquisitely written or they can be horribly written. And I know that most people on this podcast won't be copywriters. They won't be thinking, how do I craft an email that's going to be read? What are the things I need to have in it? Do you have any views about, I guess, just some highlights and some tips or some bullet points? What are the key elements of a well-written email? Yeah, perfect. Number one, is goes back to what we were just chatting about, is simplicity and human. That is absolutely number one. And what I mean by that, I'll give you, here, here's a tidbit to do. Like if you're, if you're sending emails right now and, and it's part of your process, if you're sending it from the practice, stop. Send it from the name of the coordinator, right? You want your, I want to see if I came in, I want Sally to send me a follow-up, not quote, this is the practice. So there's one thing, just have it, just change it. That little thing say, make sure it comes from the coordinator, make sure it's signed by the coordinator, not just the team, the practice. Okay. That, that removes automation in, in, in the mind. Cause pe- people see that and they say, okay, it's just some automated thing. That, that one little thing is huge. The, the second part is the simplicity of that email is key. I would recommend removing banners, removing anything that looks like it is a newsletter, for instance. So, and that would plain HTML. Plain HTML, plain text. And this is different. I'm not talking, acquisition's a little different sometimes, but I'm talking follow up after they've seen you. We want it to just be look like the coordinator is just talking to them. Okay. So I would be removing it. I would be making it plain text. I'd be, and this is now we go to, it's just a chat. Okay. Not, this is amazing about the practice and these are all the degrees. It's just a chat I'm here for you. So now start moving into content wise, just have a couple follow-ups that, you know, did you have any questions on me? I'm here for you, but it's it's very chat oriented. Mm -hmm. 
right? In terms of the actual subject lines, because that, that comes around um, with the subject lines, that's kind of a hard one. But it's you can just, just keep on the same element, though, of how would you want an email to come to you on a follow-up? What would make, you know, what would, and maybe not the um, principal, but talk, talk to someone else in the office. That's a good way. If you don't have a copywriter, if you know, how would, you know, just say, how would you want it? Like, so think again, remove yourself from a clinical that you know, what, you really know what all this stuff is to as just a patient, how, what would I do to open that? So again, really it's about coming back to helpful marketing and just, you know, doing good things to help people along the way. And just cause I can't help myself asking this question, Nathan, do you put a call to action in there or do you just keep it purely conversational and nice and short and sweet? No, no, we still have a call to action. You still always have a call to action, which usually is respond to this email or call me. Um, so I would still be putting that. So you don't you don't miss that because you don't want to just be, hey. Yeah, we're all nice, but nothing's happening. Yeah, I mean, you still are trying to get to a point. You know, I'm here for you. Can I ask what your plans are so we can update our records? That's a line that you can use because you're just saying, hey, can you help me out? You know, please reply to this email or call me at you know the number. Cool. For sure. I would always I would always put that in there. Definitely. Lovely. Nathan, I really do want to take a moment to say thanks so much for sharing your vast amounts of experience, not just in dentistry, but in marketing in general, automation. And you know, when it comes to doing all this stuff, you know, you know it inside out, upside down. There's not much that uh, gets past you. And so I'm I'm really grateful to you for sharing your insights and your wisdom. And as we wrap up today, I just want to hit you up one last time for if you had the Nathan Paris top three tips, you know, from today or, or anything that's come to mind, if there was three things you wanted to leave the audience with, what would be tip one, two, and three that people could take away? Well, let's we'll stick to the dentistry thing, but make a commitment that you are going to consistently follow up with every patient that comes in. That's a commitment, like no matter what, and come up with a way that you can do it. That's that, That's number one. That's That will help your practice more than any Facebook ad out there in the world, okay? Number two is get the team on board with that commitment. <laughs> so it's one thing to say it but the other thing is to get, get them on board and get them on board means you probably need to have a chat and this is i mean again i don't want to preach because i know there's great practices that listen to this but i think that number two is really important because we just i think i get it behind the scenes a lot by chatting that even though it's been said doesn't necessarily mean there's a commitment from the team side so get that team on board make, make sure you have that chat again that hey we're helping people and we, we need we need to be doing this. Number three, I'm never good at number three. I'll come. You know, I don't know. Why don't we li- Why don't we leave it at, <laughs> at one and two? Because three right. will be just follow rules one and two. How's that? I like that. When when all else fails, go back to number one. Yeah, it's like Warren Buffett's. He's got you know two rules of investing. Rule number one is never lose your capital. Rule number two is never forget rule number one. <laughs> that's cool it's that's better hey Nathan again really want to say thanks so much for taking the time out of your day to come and spend some time with us it's been fun hanging out as always and I'm looking forward to seeing uh, you again soon we can enjoy some craft beer we can uh, catch up on all things automation we can plead for the open API a bit more and it, as always mate it's always good to chat and uh, I thank you once more uh, Jesse absolutely thank you I obviously love chatting about this stuff so thank you for taking time you've been great you're welcome mate cheers mate cheers Thank you for listening to the Savvy Dentist podcast. For more episodes, go to drjessegreen.com slash Savvy Dentist. And to discover how to build a high-performance dental practice, visit drjessegreen.com and download the free report.